Well, I'm Linda Jansen, and this is Lee Jansen. Um, I started coming out here in 1980, so I've been coming here for 40 years. This is called Colored Sands, and everyone who comes out here always asks why it's so sandy. And it has to do with the geology from a long time ago. The last glacier that was here, which was about 15,000 years ago, it stopped at Rockton, and the rivers, the Sugar River and the other rivers flowing into this area caused a lake to form from Rockton all the way to Freeport. And um, the water flowing over the St. Peter sandstone in this area, which is only near Colored Sands Forest Preserve and um, Searles. There's only two places in Winnebago County where the sandstone comes to the surface. One is uh, uh, Colored Sands here, and the other is the Sugar River Forest Preserve. The, the St. Peter sandstone is all along the Sugar River up in Wisconsin, and uh, the uh, floodwaters created by the glacier wash the sand down here into the glacial lake that uh, Linda was talking about. And uh, from time to time, the lake would dry up and the prevailing westerly winds then blew the sand eastward, forming dunes that extended from here to Rockton. So that's where the sand came from. Um, there are many unique plants here, and because of the sand, um, a lot of them are northern plants. So Lee will tell you about the plants. Okay, the, the sand creates a hostile environment for a lot of plants because it can rain six to eight inches, and then if the next day or next week the temperature's in the 90s, it'll be dry, the sand will be dry down three or more feet. So all the plants with shallow roots cannot survive in the sand. And because of that, a lot of the northern plants stayed here instead of moving northward as the glaciers retreated. And that caused this area between here and Rockton to have a, a lot of very unusual northern plants in it that can be found nowhere else in the county and some of them uh, that are here can be found nowhere else in Illinois. So this is a sand prairie and a sand prairie uh, all the plants in the sand prairie have deep roots. For instance, one of the plants that is here is the uh, blue lupin, and blue lupin roots don't even start to branch out to their, get down over three feet, and they often extend down uh, into the soil over, over 12 feet, some as far down as 20 feet. So when it gets dry here, and uh, one uh, summer, it was real dry here. We didn't have rain for two months. And even, the trees even lost their leaves. But the blue lupin stayed green all summer long because its roots were down into the water table. So all the plants that survive here on the sand prairie have a, either various strategies for survival or they have the deep roots. And I wanted to show the book that I learned the plants on because we have every field guide for plants that this is, but this is the one that I learned on. And I really like it because it shows a picture of the flower and these are only plants in this area. And so then I, as time went on, every time I saw uh, a plant here, I wrote it in the book and the date. So this is the Courtney and Zimmerman, Wildflowers and Weeds. This, is, this plant is called uh, Cream Bactesia, and it uh, has a yellow flower. It will bloom in, a, in about two or three weeks. It has a very deep root system that goes way down, like many of the prairie plants do, the root system. Uh, goes down at least six to eight feet. This plant is flowering spurge. It blooms much later in the season, all of them, 
and at times there's so many of these plants out in the prairie that it's just white with the flowering spurge. It's a typical prairie plant. Okay, and this plant is butterfly weed. It is one of my favorite plants. It's really beautiful. It's a member of the milkweed family and it tends to grow in more sandy areas than uh, some of the other milkweeds. Right next to it here is lead plant. And uh, lead plant is a sort of a tree because it grows, in, it, instead of coming up from the ground each year like most of the prairie plants do, it stays uh, like a small tree and grows beyond where it was the year before. I remember finding one in the prairie that had a stem on it that was almost an inch in diameter. It had been there for many, many years. Okay, this plant is called hairy hawkweed. You can see why it's called hairy. As I said in the beginning that most of the prairie plants have deep roots. Hairy hawkweed does not have a deep root. Its strategy for survival in the sand prairie is the hairs on its leaf. These hairs keep the wind from touching the surface of the leaves, which reduces the loss of moisture by the plant. So it has shallow roots. It has a rosette of leaves around the base near the ground and then sends up a flower stalk that's about a foot to two feet tall with no leaves on it, but it has hairs on the stem and then has yellow dandelion-like flowers, small yellow dandelion flowers on the top. So this is a plant whose strategy for survival is to reduce evaporation. The now, Color Sands is a nature preserve, and in the 60s, Lee and George Fell went down to Springfield and they lobbied for the nature preserve's bill. And yes. I believe Illinois was the first state that has had nature preserves and a lot of the other states copied him. This is Canada tick clover. It's another plant of the sandy prairie. It has a purple flower. Uh, it will be blooming in about two or three weeks. This is called blunt leaf milkweed. It's a milkweed that grows only on sand prairies. And it has what's known as clasping leaves. The leaves form a complete circle around the stem. And these, these uh, are the flowers, it's in full bloom. And when the milkweed pods form, they form pointing up instead of down like many of the other milkweed plants do. Okay, this plant is hoary pecoon. Hoary pecoon grows on sand prairies and uh, it has a very hard seed. The seed is white and looks like porcelain. Uh, birds eat the seed, don't digest it, and then the plant is spread by the animals that eat the seed. So instead of spreading in a clump, they usually appear often far apart because they're being spread by the birds. Okay, this is called brown-eyed Susan. Brown-eyed Susan is a plant that usually grows in more disturbed areas in prairies. When prairies are planted, it's one of the first plants that really flourishes in the new prairie, but as the prairie gets more, more and more mature, it's harder to find uh, brown-eyed Susans in the prairie. This other plant is called goat's rue. And if you look, it's all over here too. And uh, goat's rue spreads uh, by runners. So if there's one plant, usually you find a bunch of them near it. And it has a very beautiful, beautiful pea-like uh, blossom. This plant is round-headed bush clover. It's another typical sand prairie plant. It uh, blooms later in the season, probably in, in late July and August. The flower is not very spectacular. It's just a little, little green, uh, green flower. Uh, there is a bush clover that has been found in uh, Winnebago Colony that's a federally endangered bush clover. It's called prairie bush clover. 
but this is round-headed bush clover. St. John's wort, there's three or four species that can be growing here. I, I don't know the name of this exact species, but it has a yellow flower, as do all the St. John's warts. And uh, this is one that grows in sandy prairies, has very small leaves. And that, again, is another strategy for survival in a sandy prairie because the small leaves uh, reduce the amount of water that's evaporated. This plant is Rough Blazing Star. It is another uh, dry prairie plant. And instead of having a root that goes down, it has a tuber like a potato. And that tuber is under the ground and it stores water in that tuber, which helps it stay green during the dry periods. It has uh, blue flowers on it, and most plants, the flowers, when they bloom, they start blooming at the bottom of the plant and move up to the upper part. In this family, uh, the flower starts blooming on top, and it blooms down the stalk. Okay, this lichen, which is growing on this wood here, is called soldier lichen, and the reason why it's called soldier lichen is bright red, so it's supposed to be the British soldiers in their red uniforms. It grows on uh, dead wood, and uh, the banding building used to have a wood shingle roof, and the entire roof was covered with soldier lichens. This is a black oak. Uh, this area, the forests around here are referred to as the black oak forest because the black oak uh, grows quite well on sandy soil. And uh, it is different from a, a lot of the oak leaves, trees, because it retains its leaves all winter long and then they fall off uh, in the spring. And part of the reason it does that is when prairie flower fires come along, the leaves burn, but it doesn't burn the stems, so there the plant is able to survive the prairie fires. And uh, all the most of the trees that you see out here on the prairie are either uh, black cherry or uh, black oak. This plant is called sand plantain. It grows on sand in very bare areas where very little other plants will grow. It has shallow roots and again its water loss is reduced by fuzzy stems, fuzzy leaves, very small leaves. And uh, you, about the only places you find sand plantain on the property here are along the paths where the, there's not other vegetation competing with it. This is, plant is called spiderwort. There are a number of species. I think this is called the Ohio spiderwort. And uh, it is a plant that grows in mostly sandy soil, although it can grow in other situations. It has very fleshy roots and uh, not too deep, but quite fleshy. And uh, it's a plant that only blooms in the morning. About noon, the flowers fold up and they, won't, they open up again the next following morning. So it only blooms in the morning. And right now is probably the peak of blooming of spiderwort. Uh, the area around here is just blue with them. It's quite beautiful. Okay, the grass growing here is primar on the sand is pr primarily little blue stem. And uh, little blue stem uh, is a bunch grass. It grows in bunches and clumps. And the roots go down uh, about four feet down into the ground. And in the fall, when the frost comes, the plant dies and it turns sort of a coral color. And if you're out here on a windy day, 
you can see the gra dead grass waving in the weeds with this coral colored grass waving in the weeds like waves in the ocean. It's a, really yeah, a beautiful, beautiful. sight. Uh, and the part of the land here is uh, higher and the glaciers, when it, they came through, scraped all the soil off. So there is very shallow soil on them. And there's places where up on the hill up here in the uh, savanna area, where the soil is only three inches deep. And up in those areas, the grass that grows predominantly is um, called Indian grass. And it grows to a height of about five feet. The, uh, the blossoms and so forth. There also is scattered throughout a, uh, that area a little bit of big blue stem also. This is thimbleweed. It's a plant that grows throughout the, the prairies here. It's interesting that we have bird, bluebird houses here and in the winter time often white-footed mice build a nest in the bluebird house so they've got a place to spend the winter. They line that nest with the down from these seed pods. The seed pods have down in it, and it's just like fluffy cotton when you pull it apart. And the mice crawl up the dead stem, harvest the, the seed, the downy stuff, and line their nests with it to help them keep warm. Okay, this is blue lupin. It's a plant that grows in very hostile environments. You can find it growing up on the tundra up by the Arctic Circle. And another variety of lupin grows in Texas. It's called the blue bonnet. And uh, lupin is, is usually done blooming by now, but this is what I guess we'd call a late bloomer. And uh, when um, the flower is at its peak. Some of these fields are solid blue with, with this plant. Uh, there are a number of really unusual plants here that we've had seen and, and are not easy to find. One is spotted coral root. Spotted coral root is an orchid that lives entirely underground. It's sapophytic. And occasionally uh, in August, it sends up a flower stalk. It has no leaves, and uh, the flower stalk has little spotted flowers on it that are about a quarter of an inch across. Other unusual plants that are here that are northern plants is Pipsisawa, and also uh, there used to be a bear berry here, or Kenikinek. Uh, it eventually was crowded out by the forest and does not is not here but that's one of the plants that was here. Another plant that's here is the daisy leaf grape fern. Uh, the furthest south the daisy leaf grape fern comes is central Wisconsin, yet the daisy leaf grape fern grows here. Okay, Colored Sands Forest Preserve not only has unusual plants, but because it has unusual plants, is an unusual ecosystem. It has quite a few unusual or at least a good quantity of uh, other animals. Uh, in the reptile area, uh, you can find hognose snakes here. You can find blue racers. I once found a blue racer that was five foot long in this area. Fox snakes, milk snakes, uh, midland brown snakes, and the very rare and unusual red-bellied snake has been found here. A northern banded water snake, and common garter snake. So it has quite a few reptiles. Uh, the river bottom, when it was more open and uh, had more prairie, had Blanding's turtles. And uh, occasionally we would find baby Blanding turtles walking to the river after hatching. One time we found a baby musk turtle hiking to the river after hatching. A baby musk turtle is a little bigger than your small fingernail. Also, there's uh, snapping turtles that we find little babies going to the river in the fall after hatching. And another turtle that we find after hatching is the 
a painted turtle, and we have both the central and western race of the painted turtle here. And the painted turtle is unusual in that it lays its eggs in June. The young mature by October, but they stay in the egg and don't hatch till spring. Now, the eggs are only four to six inches down, and the frost often goes way below that. Uh, when I was younger, when we before climate change, the frost often went down further than three feet. So these baby turtles are in the egg alive, and uh, everything around them is frozen solid, yet they're able to survive being frozen and hatch in the spring, which is a very unique for any creature that's that highly developed. There is, uh, when the beaver returned to Winnebago County and the first ones were seen in the county in 1954, they were very common along the uh, Sugar River. And when we would check the nets and walk along the river uh, from the one net that ran down to the river to another net that ran down to the river, they would often slap their tails in the water and you could hear them pass it on. The, the one nearest would slap and then the next one further down would slap. And there were uh, dozens of uh, beaver here. But uh, whenever any species usually reestablishes an area, they uh, build up in numbers and then eventually they settle back to a sustainable population. So the, the beaver occurs along the river now, but it's nowhere as numerous as it used to be. Uh, there are interesting uh, rodents here. One of the rodents that's interesting here is the, I guess it's called the jumping mouse or the kangaroo mouse that has very long back legs and hops along like a kangaroo and has a, a very long tail. It's about four or five inches long and I, I found that here. One of the things that used to be here in, in for quite a few years, but I never saw it because it was a night creature, but I would see where it dug holes in pursuit of its prey was badgers. And although I never ever saw a badger here, uh, I constantly saw its, its places where it was digging and where it was living. And one March, there was an early snowstorm, a late snowstorm on March 23rd, and the next morning I found a woodcock nest with eggs in it, with the woodcock incubating it, with, with snow all around her. And there was a set of tracks coming from the hill going down to the river, and there was snow on all the weeds, and this, these tracks were two inches long, so they they're, had big feet, but it was walking under stuff that was only six inches high and not knocking the snow off of it. And it was a otter, and this was back before the otter was more regular in the county. It's just fairly regular in the county now. So that was a big thrill. Colored Sands Forest Preserve also is the location of the Sand Bluff Bird Observatory, which uh, I started in 1967. Um, it is one of the most uh, productive as far as the number of birds banded for any volunteer operated banding station in the United States. And there are several reasons for this. First of all, the Sugar River Valley itself is very biologically diverse and has been recognized by the federal government as a major area for uh, biodiversity and uh, it has a lot of the wild habitat here which provides food and shelter and nesting areas for a number of birds, some of which are fairly unusual, such as the clay-colored sparrow has nested here and the uh, Henslow sparrow has nested here. It also hosts uh, two birds that have spectacular displays, one of which is the whippoorwill, which calls whippoorwill, whippoorwill, throughout the night, and the other is the woodcock that does an aerial display in the evening. And if you can come out to the parking lot in uh, March, April, or May, 
you may hear the, the woodcocks do their display. They make a sound on the ground and then they fly up into the air and vibrate their wings, which produces first a twittering sound and then a warbling sound. And that, all that sound is produced by vibrating their wings in the air. Um, colored sand is a good place for birds because we are north of what I refer to as the Great Corn Desert. Um, Central Illinois up to the counties that grow right at the very edge of the state line is all corn and there when birds are migrating after they've flown all night they have to land and find a place to feed and a cornfield either with corn in it or without corn in it does not provide any shelter or food or an old soybean field for migrating birds so when they start across Illinois, they pretty much have to come clear up to the northern tier of counties to find a suitable shelter and food. So that's one of the reasons why we catch so many birds here, other than the fact there's a lot of natural habitat, is that uh, the bird has to, uh, this is the first area that they come to when there's lots of places to eat and, and find shelter. And, and I've been interested in the natural world uh, since the early 40s. I became interested in birds in 1943. And I've seen so much of the natural world disappear with the onslaught of uh, civilization and the use of chemicals and things of that sort. For instance, uh, bird populations today on an average are less than 20% of what they were 50 years ago. And the natural world is disappearing. But anybody can, that owns a piece of property can help the natural world by allowing natural vegetation to grow on their yard. Well, we would like to invite people to come out to Colored Sands Forest Preserve. There are hiking trails. It's beautiful out here. The bird banding isn't going on now but um, there's a lot to see in the plants and the birds and so forth. And any time is a good time to come out here. You'll never know what you're going to see. And you also need to be aware this is the mosquito capital of the world. So you need to have insect repellent or have something to keep the insects off if you're out here most of the time.